Thanks, uh, Steve, and all the uh, Red Monk crew and all the sponsors for making putting on a great show. Really enjoyed it. This is my first time. Um, I submitted a talk for 2014, but that didn't get picked up for some reason. And uh, when I was trying to, somebody had sent me the uh, the call for presenters, and like this is like the the conference for you. You were this is like made for you. And when I uh, submitted, the, came up with this talk, I was like. If they don't pick it, I don't know who else will. <laughs> so it's uh, Homebrew Ops uh, and kind of my approach to adding automation uh, and control to my homebrewing hobby. Um, let's see. So last year I brewed about eight beers. Um, and kind of my style is kind of experimental. I like to think a little bit out of the box. I don't know if you ever watch Brew Dogs which is a great show on Esquire Network. The Brew Dogs Brewery guys, they come and they, they just think out of the box about you know, what the ingredients are. They pull from either whatever location they're at. They're brewing on a cruise boat or a train. or It's a really awesome show. Um, so my approach lately has been to kind of like, you know, think of something that I wouldn't normally be able to get. So let's see, this year I did a Peanut, Reese's Peanut Butter Cup Porter, which was two pounds of Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. I did a uh, che Honey Nut Cheerio Golden Ale, which was <laughs> a box of uh, Honey Nut Cheerios in the boil, which I, out of the five gallon batch, I only got uh, two and a half gallons because there's like a, just a layer of muck, like Cheerio muck. So, <laughs> but anybody who ever had it was, said it was great. Um, so, this conference in particular is probably a lot of home brewers, it seems like. At least that, that's what I got the sense. Who who's, considers themselves a home brewer in the audience? Yeah, so pretty good, pretty good number. Um, so did you start with this? <laughs> Mr. Beer is by far the, I got this for Christmas probably about four years ago, and that's when I kind of got into home brewing. But Mr. Beer makes the home brewing process completely simple. Uh, results in a beer-like substance in the end. <laughs> you got this like can of like I guess it's like molasses or tar, and you throw it in the like a, a boiling water, and then you add your hops and you bottle it up in those bottles, and you add some sugar, and about three or to three weeks later, you have something that resembles beer, and it's not. It actually isn't that bad. It's a really good way to kind of get into the home brewing process and really understand what it is and how to how it works at least the, the, the basic parts. Um, so if you're like me, then once you've kind of gotten bored of Mr. Beer, uh, which happens pretty quickly, you, you'll scale up to five gallon batches. Um, so that's one of the buckets that I use. Don't, use. don't use the glass carboys, they're terrible to clean. This is just a food grade bucket that I drilled a hole in the top and that works perfect. Uh, so then if you, like Mr. Beer is, they consider that extract brewing, so all that boiled process to turn the grains in, in, into sugar uh, has been done for you and condensed into a can. So you might get uh, into like uh, partial mash, which is uh, part of part uh, dry dehydrated malt and uh, real actual grains. Um, and then once you're at five gallons and you bottled enough beer, uh, when you're doing five gallons, it's probably about, I don't know, 50 bottles you have to clean and sanitize and cap. You'll definitely want to get into kegging, and uh, that's what I did here. This was a kegerator that I picked up uh, when I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, so UVA, and when their kids, when the students are leaving uh, for the summer, these things are basically free. <laughs> I think I paid like 20 or 30 bucks for it. Um, and then I graduated into all grain brewing. This is a method called brew in a bag, so it's about 10 pound grain bill. Uh, add that into uh, this mesh bag um, and the, the water at the right temperature. And uh, you just pull out this big sack of grain, which at, at once it's absorbed, about a gallon of water weighs about 30 pounds. But this is much closer to what the actual home, the actual production brewers will do with uh, Brewing beer, they don't use Mr. Beer <laughs> for some reason. Maybe Anheuser Busch. I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past them. So I began to wonder, you know, what's next for the home brewing process for me? You know, five gallon, two five gallon kegs in my uh, kegerator is plenty enough, and 
it, it does the job of, you know, justifying to my wife why I need five gallons of beer. <laughs> um, so, I was watching a uh, documentary um, about Two Roads Brewery. It was done by, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Small Empires, it's on the Verge uh, website. Uh, Alexis from Reddit uh, hosts it. And he goes around to different startups and gets their story about how they started. And he did a profile on a, a non-tech company, which is uh, Two Roads Brewery. But what struck me was uh, that Two Roads brews their own Two Roads brand beer, but they built out this massive, humongous facility from day one, production, huge production that they can do, way more than what they would ever need to service their current customer base. And why they did it was it's a brewing platform. It's not just for their own beer. It's for uh, anybody who it's specifically kind of geared towards any small brewery that's, you know, craft, small hometowns, craft brewery that's ready to kind of expand out to the next level. But they don't want to, you know, trying to make that jump from a small brewery to uh, being able to service a good production, um, create a good production amount, costs a, a lot of money. So what they do is they outsource basically that production process to out two roads. And when they were doing the uh, documentary, they kind of went into like just the level of automation and control that the two roads can uh, do to reproduce these uh, you know, crafts, handmade beers uh, at production volume. And it, that's what really struck me about two roads was just the, the level of control of just about the entire process from end to end. Um, and that was something I kind of wanted to capture in what I was trying to, my next step for my home brewing process. And one of the things that kind of I, I took away from that uh, documentary was that uh, if you want quality and consistency, you need fine grain control of the uh, entire process. So about me, I'm a, basically a software engineer. I work for a company called Vivid Cortex. We do, uh, we're basically new relic specifically for databases. So I know something about measuring stuff, time series data, um, and I, I've, over the, uh, my career, I've gotten like picked up a lot of tidbits about you know what to, some ideas about you know building all automation. Like specifically, one of my strong points is um, delivery pipelines, aut automated build systems, testing. Um, which, when I kind of think about the brewing process, it's, it kind of there's a lot of similarities or overlaps. You know, I'm I'm putting a raw in, raw ingredients into this system, and it's turning it into a final product, uh, which uh, like raw source source code going into the uh, build pipeline, going through tests, different ins and outs of uh, quality control that happen within this this box and the result is a, a final production system. So when I kind of think about my home brewing process, I kind of want something similar to that. Like, I think of like the grains going in and the, uh, my brewing system to be kind of like, almost like a build system that I would use for uh, building code or delivering uh, product, products to the, the web. Uh, the other thing is like, you know, my, if you're anything like me, then uh, you probably never, haven't touched a actual physical server and well over 10 years, seven, eight years. Uh, and my, my entire career is like virtual engineering of parts and pieces and not really being able to, there's nothing to like hand put together. There's no like physical Legos that I can kind of piece together. Everything's virtual. So, you know, there's a, this kind of childhood uh, need to kind of like put things together and uh, physical things I would like to kind of exercise and, and indulge in. So putting the, the ops and hops. Um, so these are kind of some of the things that I've kind of picked up as a software uh, delivery engineer type person that, um, that I kind of starting to apply to my uh, home brewing process. And uh, one of the things is premature optimization is uh, uh, not overdoing it to begin with, not going all crazy with something that you don't need, don't know you don't need yet, or don't know you need yet. Um, so the the rise of the brew bots, if you've been like, what, a lot of Kickstarter campaigns have come up where they've got these awesome bots. I mean, this thing looks like a toaster, and you put the grains in there, and like, it does pretty much the entire process for you. Uh, I forgot what, that's a Pico Brew Zymatic. Um, 
There's the brew bot, which looks beautiful. And uh, again, it's completely automated. You basically put the grains and the water in, out comes beer. And uh, was that the uh, brewery? And again, another kind of tabletop system that uh, you can pretty much does the entire process for you. And I look at these things and I think this is just premature optimization right there. It's like, I don't know if I need all that control. I'm not sure what level of control it gives me. I, I look at it and it looks like a Heroku to me. It's like, it's re probably really locked down and it's like, there's only so many things I can probably do with it. If I wanted to throw, you know, 10 pounds of, or, or two pounds of peanut butter cups in there, I don't think that would work. <laughs> um, so another thing is that I kind of take away as being like a software engineer trying to automate my home brewing process is just make it work. So uh, this was kind of like a breakdown of my, uh, my uh, last Sunday, I uh, brewed, brewed a batch and this is kind of like, it was like a four hour day of uh, brewing. This is kind of like a percentage breakdown of how much time I spent on each one of these tasks or how much time I had to wait. Um, so of that time, the actual kind of stuff where I'm actually doing something as opposed to waiting is, uh, it's mostly waiting, the home brewing process. There's not a ton of uh, things to do other than clean and, and throw some stuff in the boil or, or move uh, things around. So this was kind of the beginning of it. Uh, the very first brew, home brewing robot that I, did, I used was, this is nothing more than just a, a uh, um, temperature probe for cooking like a turkey or something and a, t a, a timer that you can set or a, a threshold you can set on the temperature it hit. So for $15, picked that up, threw it in the, through the temperature probe in the uh, pot and would set the temperature for whatever I wanted the water to hit and then it would start beeping. So now I didn't have to wait around the uh, brew pot all day, all day taking temperatures, waiting for it to hit a certain amount, I would, I would get an alert and uh, know that it's now time to start the mashing process or start the boiling process. <coughs> uh, unfortunately, what I found out that this temperature probe is not water resistant. So what happened, it ruined actually one batch where it just started going crazy, it wouldn't read right. So that was, that was disappointing. I, I went through two of them before I figured out what the problem was. <laughs> so you start with uh, just making it work and then over time, you evolved to making it great. This is not my system, but these guys have uh, built this robot, built brewing robot themselves. So that's kind of the ideal of what I would like to get to. Uh, this is what I kind of take from like the agile kind of me methodology. I call it the brew ops loop. So basically, you start by drinking. You, d you kind of think about what you want to do next as far as your home brewing process goes, what part you want to automate. Then you hack out the solution, and then you brew the beer, and then you repeat. And once you start drinking the beer that you brewed before, you've bootstrapped the process, and it's far more efficient than it was before. <laughs> so Sunday, I did some more plumbing, drilled a hole in my brew pot, put a valve in it, Went, did a shopping trip to Lowe's, picked up one of these Igloo coolers, put a valve in that one, um, which was really easy. So the current state of things is, uh, this is where I'm at. This is Brutron, which I kind of think of Brutron as almost like Voltron, uh, in the sense that he's not just one robot, he's many robots that you can kind of put together, and he becomes this awesome, super automated brewing machine. Not quite where the, I'm at the actual picture of the first one, but Brutron is made up of Mastron, Boiltron, and Fermentron. Uh, Mastron, <laughs> Mastron is in charge of the uh, mashing process. He tells me when uh, the mash temperature has hit the right, um, um, the, the, the strike water, which is where you put, when you put the grains, has hit the right temperature, and uh, when the mashing process is done. Uh, Boiltron does basically the same thing for the boiling process, and uh, Fermentron does the, basically the same thing for that. And uh, all it is right now is a Raspberry Pi, uh, this DS18B20 temperature sensor that you can pick up on Amazon. I got like a bundle of them for like $15. Node.js and Cylon.js. So it's just the breadboard right there. Um, that's the temperature probe pot, uh, wired into the uh, breadboard. And underneath there is the Raspberry Pi, and that's in 
encased right now in a uh, $3 Lowe's toolbox for protection. <laughs> it's splash, splash protection, so that's a better picture of it. This is like, you know, another thing, you know, being a software engineer, working on, you know, virtual machines, you know, I don't get to, like, wire things together physically like this, so that was interesting and fun. There's a lot of good guides online to, uh, to help you figure this out, because I know nothing about um, actually physically wiring electronics together. So this is kind of like a picture of the current setup. Um, again, doing it the hard way right now. I have to actually physically pick these up and put them on my, my uh, stand when I want to start moving water from one of these vessels to another one. But using propane and um, so it's mostly an outdoor process. So a little about setting up one of these Raspberry Pis to do kind of what I did. So. Uh, you have to install um, some uh, modules to get the temperature to sensor to work, which um, is just the W1 GI GPI and yeah W1 Therm to uh, make the temperature sensor uh, right to and yeah that's um, this is ensuring that they start up on the next startup of the um, the uh, Raspberry Pi. And that will uh, create, the temperature sensor will output uh, the data to this file where the file is going to be the, uh, the, the main directory is going to be this uh, serial number, uh, which is the serial number of the temperature sensor. And then it outputs this, which the only thing that really you care about is this number right here, which is the uh, degrees in Celsius divide, which you have to divide by a thousand to get the actual, the point the actual Celsius value that you want, and then you can convert that to uh, Fahrenheit. Um, so a little bit about Cylon.js, which is the uh, JavaScript framework for robotics that I use. Um, so Cylon.js is just a, a good old node um, JS application. Uh, you can instantiate it by uh, calling Cylon and uh, robot is kind of like the, the abstraction um, where with inside robot you can kind of uh, tell it to do different functions inside the work function and then uh, a start function to actually get the robot to start up. And then we use a connection called uh, the loop back adapter which causes the, this thing to run in a loop basically just calling back on itself over and over again so a runtime loop and then when something interesting happens, you can emit an event. And when you emit an event, you can, uh, where is it? So every 10 seconds, I can sample the uh, temperature uh, using um, just a function I created to just grab, parse out the temperature from the, um, that file that the uh, temperature probe wrote. And then uh, when something, when that temperature hits a certain threshold, I can emit an event like heat the water or water is heated. And then I, within this run loop, um, once that event happens, only once do something here. So that's, that's basically the gist of uh, Cylon.js and what it does. So another thing I take away from being a uh, software engineer is to measure everything. And I use StatsD, which uh, if you're not familiar with StatsD, it's just a Node JS application, and I can just um, push metrics over UDP to it from uh, my my um, Cylon JS um, uh, application, and I push those to Labrato metrics so I can get graphs. So that's the simplest thing that works at the moment. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. I wasn't able to see actually how the uh, the boil process, how the temperature changes over time in the boil process or the mashing process. Unfortunate, side, unfortunate thing, thing with uh, Labrato metrics is that it down samples after about a, I think, a 24 hour period. So all the granularity in this graph, since it's only about, I don't know, one second time scale right here is going to be lost. So I'll have to fix that eventually, but for now, it's just a proof of concept and it works. So, so another thing is uh, I pick up as being a software engineer is worst is better sometimes. 
So one exa perfect example of this is uh, Brutron is actually a Twitter bot, and that's how I got uh, notifications about the different uh, different uh, thresholds or time that's been uh, been passed. I was thinking I was going to use maybe like Twilio and have text messages sent to me, and I was like, nah, you know, Twitter's free. <laughs> plus, it's more in plus it's more interesting to uh, have it be kind of like a social thing. And also, too, I can tell like how much time has passed by each one of these tweets because of the number the number of uh, minutes that have passed since the last tweeted that tweet happened. Um, I think I've gotten also a couple of like retweets from like, various <laughs> various other sources about you know mentioning Brutoad or something like that. Um, so it, it pushes a, a, a push notification to my phone and I can stop whatever I was doing, like washing the dog or doing guard work to, to uh, go and attend to Brutron's needs. And uh, backlog, so that's basically where Brutron is at at the moment. Um, and certainly there's a lot of ambition to move forward with different things. So one, now that I got some plumbing hooked up, and valve and um, some ins and outs. I can start adding pumps. So this is like a food grade pump. I think they're like twenty five, twenty six dollars, depending on where you get them from. Uh, rated yeah, they're rated at boil temperature. Okay. Yeah. That's, so, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Leaking, leaking would be bad. <laughs> yeah. So uh, solenoids and valves, or solenoid valves would be a lot of fun. I mean, there's a whole ecosystem of different things that you can kind of hook into Raspberry Pi and do and make work, so that's one of them. I uh, have to figure out a water volume sensor at some point. I'm not exactly sure how to pull this off. I found a couple of articles about using like uh, uh, various methods, like either a captive um, uh, sensor or uh, like a, what was it? Yeah, there's a couple of them. Cloud controller, I need to, I'd like to, right now all the logic is on the Raspberry Pi itself about what it does. I want to move that to the cloud so the Raspberry Pi is just kind of a dumb collector and that would be a lot easier to deploy and, uh, you know, potential other conveniences that, that would uh, create. And uh, build the community. So there's a lot of articles that have, found of people doing all sorts of different things with automating home brewing. They've got like full home brewing robots in their laundry room or they've kind of built different components like this is a wart chiller so uh, inside there is like a copper coil and the water, water goes in and out um, around that copper coil and then you can run your uh, wart, hot wart through it to cool it down. Uh, they've built these things like bubble uh, counters to try to figure out when the uh, fermentation process is starting to slow down and it's ready for the next uh, either being bottled or moved to the next uh, ferment fermentation vessel. Uh, this was from an article where they're discussing how to actually measure the specific gravity of the beer. Um, there's one thing called the brew bug which kind of uses a similar method but um, if the hydrometer will have a certain amount of weight that you could potentially measure by using a it would have to be a scientific scale. Um, so there was a discussion about that and the brew bug, which is a commercial product, uh, I think it's like $150 or so, kind of uses the same methodology. So it would be interesting just to do it myself and document it. Uh, fermentation chamber would probably is actually kind of on the last of the list of things to do is just because it's the most expensive part of it. Um, so this would control the uh, temperature of the fermentation process. There's a uh, thing called the, um, or a project called, uh, is it the brew pie? Yeah, brew pie that actually kind of gives you full control over the uh, fermentation temperature. Uh, you can s do spikes or different, change the fermentation temperature over time inside a potential uh, a fermentation chamber like this. So that would be interesting, either adopt that or uh, uh, do something myself. Uh, this guy is controlling his the uh, propane uh, flow on his on the uh, the propane burner using a Raspberry Pi and a, a solenoid, which is probably what I would do since I've already kind of invested in doing it with propane. Uh, 
That's where it gets fun, right? Fire plus robots is way more awesome than just <laughs> robots or electricity. So I've kind of still kind of thinking about this. It's kind of still in an early stage, but you know, I think there's probably an opportunity to kind of like gather all this, all these projects into one uh, resource, which I've called the Open Home Brewing Automation Project. Uh, there's like the Open ag ag Agriculture Project, which is I kind of think of that as kind of a similar thing where they they spec'd out all sorts of different farming equipment that you can build from scratch, um, and built like a, a repository of information about how to do that. It'd be kind of awesome to kind of consolidate all the home brewing stuff into one uh, project that you could use to find out more about uh, building different components and how people maybe a, a robot registry of where you can register your home brewing robot and how you did it. So that basically concludes my talk. This was actually an interesting little story. So um, when uh, our team from Uruguay came down, I brewed them a beer specifically for the event, called it Brown Doge Bacon Ale. It was a, uh, bur a ale with uh, bacon-infused uh, bourbon. And um, on our local Reddit feed, somebody has a, a doge that was sticking its head out the window. And I was like, well, if you bring the doge over to the office, I'll give you one of the bottles of beer that uh, that we uh, brewed for it for the event, and they brought them by, and it was pretty awesome. <laughs> so I got some references to resources of, that, of different things that I've picked up on the web to make what I've got now, and uh, some of the, the code for all the brutrons that I put together. And yeah, that's it.